Good morning to everybody, to who is here with us, and to who is here at some point in the cyberspace. Uh, later we'll tell you how many people are in the cyberspace. Uh, I'll be your master of ceremonies for this very special morning where we have the honor of having Professor Peretz Laviz, the president of Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology, with us. Uh, Professor Paulo Saudiva, the director of the institute, will uh, open, will do the welcome. Then Dr. Marcos Vinicius Souza, who is uh, the undersecretary of the recently uh, un uh, enacted undersecretary of science, technology, and innovation, will make a brief introduction. And then Professor Perez Lavi, who is already here. And finally, questions and answers. And if the rector comes, he can do whatever he wants because he wants to say something also. Uh, we just signed an agreement or the renewal of an agreement a few minutes ago with Professor Laura, who is here from the international office. Uh, Paulo. Good morning, everybody. I will be brief. And, uh, but I, I, I should. I think I should say that uh, express the gratitude to Ali, who brought uh, Professor Peretz here. First, thank you for coming. Because Technion has a reputation. Uh, it's like a reference in the in production of knowledge and devising uh, technology in the benefit of mankind. Uh, and, and, and this uh, Technion has a, a structure that is for us, using the Brazilian regulations, the structure of the university, which is beyond imagination uh, for our standards. Uh, especially because uh, uh, Technion is not uh, uh, only a technological platform and uh, a producer of medical and health solutions, but also of principles. And science, especially in the health system, does not preclude the, uh, the existence of principles, and motivations. Uh, I would say I don't, don't want to be metaphysical, because now it's, uh, it's quite common in our country. Uh, but uh, it, each institution has a soul, as a, what they consider uh, its main mission. And so the project was established using a vision, a clear vision of mission. And this is also badly needed, not only in Brazil, but uh, I think the world is necessary, needs to renew the mission, the role, especially for our scientists. Professor, we have a full crowd, and we have many, much more people uh, seeing us uh, remotely. So I have to stop because uh, this is supposed to, to be a meeting where smart people speak. Uh, uh, I have the first, the first speaker made uh, follow the script. Uh, the, set, the person that will follow me also will follow the, the script. So I am the outlier uh, at that moment. And please, uh, fill the, your, this space as yours. And please find, uh, uh, find an institute of house Thank you, Paulo. Uh, uh, before I say some words more about uh, Marcus Vinicius, I would just uh, like to recognize uh, uh, the presence. Uh, so many friends here that I cannot mention everybody, but I just would like to recognize the presence of the Vice Consul of the State of Israel, the President of the Brazilian Technion Society. Uh, on behalf of the faculty here present, and we are happy to have so many faculty, I would like to thank Professor Baraka, our uh, uh, 
provost or vice president for undergraduate studies to be with us. He was also before. I would like to uh, thank especially Professor Regina Marcus, who is a member of our board and gives us uh, directions to be here. And uh, I would like to make a special reference to a dear friend and former student of this university, Marcelo Nakagawa, who is sitting there and who is a champion of entrepreneurship and innovation in this area. Thank you so much. Also, Dr. Claudio Rodriguez, who is the president of our incubator. Uh, Marcos Vinicius Souza, we knew each other some years ago, and uh, he became, as a very young, he became the secretary of innovation of the now uh, extinct Ministry of Industry and Trade, which was incorporated in the Ministry of Economy, and uh, did a brilliant job, some activities together with Marcelo, and uh, uh, he, uh, we had the pleasure of having him in 2010 in a mission to Israel uh, organized by Amprotec, the Association of Incubators and Science and Technology Parks. It was a bit before Israel became a hype in innovation, and uh, so uh, when we knew that you were coming to Sao Paulo and uh, uh, would be helping us uh, during the coming four years, we could not have any better options and invite you to present some words. Marcus, please. Thank you, Professor Ari. Uh, well, good morning. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm the new undersecretary for science, technology, innovation here at Sao Paulo State. But I'm still with one foot in the ministry because the paperwork is not finished yet. But I also, I'm already appointed as the undersecretary here. And I would like to, it's a really pleasure to be here because as Professor, Professor Ari Polonsky mentioned, my first visit to Israel was in 2010. And I would say that one was one of the most amazing experience that I had in my life because I could say that I was infected by the Israeli virus and it really surprised me what they were doing that at that time and since then I went there four times again so I, I went four times to Israel uh, I visited Ternion uh, also in one of the visits but in the last eight years every year I sent somebody of my team to understand and know the Israeli innovation system. And some of the lessons that we learned there were applied here. You can remember during the regulatory framework, the new innovation law that we updated in the last years, most part of the proposal that we did in our Ministry of Industry was based on Israeli experience. And it was a really hard experience also because we were trying to sign an agreement, an innovation cooperation agreement with Israel for, it took me three years. Professor was following all the, the process because there were some ideologies that were against this cooperation, but we convinced the all government about the importance to do that. I think it was one of, one of the few agreements that the government has with Israel was innovation. And, and after that, we, we launched many call for proposals, and it's a really great experience. If, if somebody here didn't visit Israel, please do it. Uh, I visit the main eco innovation ecosystem in the world, and everywhere I go, including Silicon Valley and Boston area and so on, when I compare what they are doing in Israel, uh, it's really impressive. Uh, Please, who has the opportunity to go and visit? It's uh, a lesson about how to do great things with low resource in an extremely pragmatic way. So this uh, is something that we really would like to continue to this kind of engagement. And now uh, I was invited by the new Secretary of Economic Development here in the state, Patricia Ellie. And one of the goals of Patricia is exactly how we could make Sao Paulo global. Because Sao Paulo is already the best and the, bigger, the biggest uh, ecosystem, economic or scientific, in Latin America. Now I think we are in a 
really good position to go global, including competing global, but mainly partnering global. So uh, I'd like to open the doors from our secretariat to start a new negotiation with Ternion to begin new activities here in Brazil, uh, in the Sao Paulo state, and here with this university and other universities that we have here. So I'd like to invite this to start this negotiation, and I hope you have a good event. As you mentioned, now I will give the word and the floor for the smart people, because I'm just a learner. <laughs> Thank you much. Thank, thank you so much for your kind uh, and uh, words. And uh, uh, usually uh, you present the speaker, but in this case, as I had the privilege of hearing uh, also some presentations of Professor Lavie, I understand that he is part of the presentation. Uh, he is a, a researcher, uh, very important in the area of sleep. He created companies. He was the dean of the School of Medicine, the president of the Technion, et cetera, et cetera. But he uh, knows how to embed his personal story in the story of the Technion and the transformation of Israel. So allow me not to make a formal long presentations that I could do, because you will do it much better than myself. Peret, thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you for coming. Um, I came to Sao Paulo on Friday. I'm leaving tonight. I feel at home. Um, the hospitality, the friendship, uh, simply overwhelming. And I'd like to thank uh, everyone who had uh, part in organizing my visit uh, from the bottom of my heart. What I'd like to do now is to tell you the story of the Technion and how one university, a single university, changed the face of its country. And I believe that there are few examples in the world, if any, that match this story. And it's really an amazing story. A story where one university turn a country that is half desert, surrounded by uh, not so friendly neighbors, into uh, what uh, Mark described as a citadel of innovation. And uh, the story um, of Startup Nation is closely linked with Techno Nation. In fact, the Technion was the one who provided the backbone for uh, what we call now Startup Nation. Israel now is uh, based on uh, some of the international indices of competitiveness. It's number one in researchers in R&D per capita. It's number two in uh, the availability of venture capital or VCs. Is number three in uh, business entrepreneurship, and number four as the most innovative country. Uh, for a country of uh, eight and a half million people, um, 70 years old, in uh, the Middle East, this is quite achievements. When you look into global startup ecosystem ranking, uh, Tel Aviv is number five. But this is not Tel Aviv, it's Israel. Because uh, when you say Tel Aviv, you talk about 50% of the population of Israel. In fact, you have a mega, megalopolis between Haifa and Tel Aviv. And uh, most of the population are uh, concentrated between Haifa and Tel Aviv. But look, London is number six, Chicago seven, Seattle eight, Berlin nine, Singapore 10. And um, there is not a single week during which we do not have some kind of a delegation that come to the Technion to learn how you achieve such a prominent position in the world of innovation. Some blame us that we put something in the water of our students. It's not true. Um, Israeli high-tech exits, 2011-2016, between five and seven billion US dollars a year. Fundraising of these uh, startups 
as you can see, climbing from 2.2 to 5.3 in 2016, uh, 710 deals. Again, a country of 8.5 million people. Uh, this is the data for the first half of uh, 2018. Uh, exits, $6.2 billion. Uh, funds raised $3.2 billion of startups. The first six months of 2018. Israel is a hub of R&D centers of every major multinational corporation, 403, 404. You can find uh, all of them, IBM and Oracle and SAP and Samsung and IBM and uh, Boston Scientific and EMC Square and AT&T, all of them established an R&D center in Israel. Uh, Intel, Haifa, is responsible for 75% of the profits of Intel worldwide. When there is a, a computer, an Intel inside, in fact, it's Haifa inside. Our problem is that our students from the Technion, which is about 12 minutes drive from Intel, spend more time in Intel than in the classrooms. On the one hand, it's a good experience. On the other hand, they extend their studies by half a year, and we are punished by the government for that. Inefficiency. Eric Schmidt, the decision to invest in Israel was one of the best that Google has ever made. Let me jump forward. When we won the competition in New York to open a branch of the Technion together with Cornell on Roosevelt Island, the campus was under construction, and I got a telephone call from this man, Eric Schmidt. And he said, Professor Lavie, we have headquarters in Manhattan, in Chelsea. We have, for you, 63,000 square feet. Come start the operation in New York at the Google headquarters. I told him how much it's going to cost me. So it's free. Not only it's free, I'll pay the electricity bill. Say, Mr. Schmidt, why? I would like to be close to you. For four years, we started operating in Google's headquarters in Chelsea, starting teaching. We moved to Roosevelt Island only on September 2017. Eric Schmidt now established a fund in Israel to support women, women who would like to have a career in engineering organized by the Technion. So, how it all started. And here, as I said, it's quite amazing to follow the threads of history from the beginning because the contribution of different elements provide you a picture that is rather unique. Part has to do with the Israeli DNA. I call it the chutzpah factor. Then, there is the necessity that is the mother of invention. Third, human resources, military service, and immigration. I'll touch every one of them. Fourth, government support. Government plays a role. And the fifth one, and to me the most important, and I'm going to convince you that this was the most important, is the technical factor. Without the Technio, none of these elements could make the change. You need a university at the background that will provide the expertise, will provide the spirit in order to get out of the potential of the Israeli DNA, of the necessities of human resources, the best. And in order to uh, start, Israeli DNA is very unique. I am um, on the advisory board of uh, several universities in the world. One of them is KAIST, Korean Institute of Science and Technology. And uh, each time I go to Korea, I'm interviewed by the Korean press. And in one of the trips, a journalist asked me, how can you explain the phenomenon of startup nation? Korea is very advanced technologically. I don't have to convince you. Samsung, LG, Hyundai, whatever, Kaya. 
I had a translator, a girl who studied in the Hebrew University, Hebrew, Korean girl, and she told me, Professor Lavi, let me answer the question, please. I said, okay, go ahead. And she told the journalist, I grew up in Seoul. I was the best in my class, number one, in math, in physics, in English, in chemistry. But one day, my teacher called my parents to complain about me. What was the complaint? She's asking too many questions. And she told the journalist, this is the difference. In the Technion, uh, when I used to lecture, I, I was a faculty member in medicine and I gave lectures to students. Very often, somebody raised his hand after my second sentence. He said, Professor Lavi, I'm sorry, you don't know what you are talking about. This is the Israeli DNA. This is challenging everything. This is questioning everything without respect to authority. It's a kind of an organized chaos. You are direct. You don't uh, play uh, games. There is no royalties. So this is part of the DNA. Another difference that I found, and this is amazing, I gave a talk in Japan. Thousand students in the audience. It was uh, during lunch time, so they have lunch boxes. You could measure, it was a millimeter difference in the line of the lunch boxes. I spoke for about an hour. At the end of my talk, I asked, any questions? None. Silence. Nobody raised his hand. It was amazing. After the talk, my host, the chairman of uh, the department, came to me and he said, you know, we're going to have a conference in a couple of months. I'd like you to come earlier to spend time with the students to show them that you are flesh and blood, that they can talk with you because the fear of authority is unbelievable. Risk-taking. We are living in a country that almost every day is a risk. You have to know how to take risk. Moreover, you have to sustain failures. Some of our most successful entrepreneurs failed 10 times before the 11th time they succeeded. In Korea, if you failed once, it's a shame not enough for you, for the entire family. There is no any attitude toward risk taking. So the Israeli uh, DNA, first we go global from inception. I mean, a market of 8 million people. We must find global markets. It's a must-win attitude. We cannot afford to lose. I don't want to describe to you if we lose only one of our woes. Tolerance of failure. You have to learn how to deal with failure. Failure is a learning experience. Learning experience. And if you do not know how to deal with failures, don't even think about becoming an entrepreneur. Question everything. Don't take anything for granted. Question. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Knock on every door. Cost-effective use of limited resources. You mentioned we are a poor country. We don't have any natural resources. So you have to use them wisely and effectively. Solution-driven approach to real problems, and we have a short history. There is no rituals, there are no rituals, there, are no, there is no tradition, everything is almost the presence. So the buzzwords in the Israeli ecosystem is chutzpah, team, ambitious, persistence, improvisation, personal example, fast movers, etc., etc. So this is the Israeli DNA. I like uh, Shimon Peres, our late uh, ninth president, who said, the greatest contribution of Israelis in history is their dissatisfaction from everything. It is bad for politics, it's good for science. And he's very right. He's very right. You can be an excellent scientist if you are dissatisfied with the knowledge that is available to you. Necessity is the mother of invention. You are a vast country, vast country. 
I mean, uh, I, when I give talks in China, since we have now a campus in China, I tell the Chinese, uh, guess how many Israelis there are. Always they start from 200 million. Always. I said, no, less. 150, less. 100, less. Then they are lost. What do you mean 8 million? I mean, this is one city, small city in China. So I tell them, look, no wonder we fit to the Chinese because together the Chinese and the Israelis are 20% of the world. We will change it. <laughs> they love it. They love it. Together with the Brazilian, we are less than 20%. But we can do wonders. Necessity is the mother of invention. I'll give you some examples of necessity. When I ask in general lectures, and I like to do it also always in France, who should get a medal for the Israeli high-tech booming industry? Nobody guess that this is the person, the one who is standing next to David Ben-Gurion, the tall guy, Charles de Gaulle. Why Charles de Gaulle should get a medal from the high-tech industry in Israel? Because after the Six-Day War in 1967, he imposed an embargo on the Israeli Air Force. Up to that point, the Israeli Air Force relied on the French, the Mirage jet fighters, semiconductors for night vision devices, air-to-air -air missiles detector. The goal didn't like the outcome of the war and imposed an embargo. The Technion in 1969 opened the Microelectronic Institute on one purpose alone, to produce the first semiconductors for the Israeli Air Force. This was the beginning of the high-tech sector in Israel. It's hard to believe. Amazing. So here is a university that came to the service of its country. Nobody thought about high-tech industry. They wanted semiconductors. Dripping irrigation, Rafi Mehudar, Technion graduate. How do you bloom a desert when you don't have water? You should have Use, you should use water very economically and very efficiently. This is how the dripping irrigation system was developed. Netafim just was sold to a Spanish company for some billions. Desalination. Israel is number one in the world in using desalinated water. Necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, this one that you probably know, Iron Dome. Iron Dome is a necessity of top priority in Israel. Why? Because imagine that two gunfighters facing each other, and you have to hit the bullet coming at you with your own bullet. This is how Iron Dome is functioning. Every single engineer involved, except for Danny Gold, who is the head of the program, the administrator, every single engineer developing the Iron Dome system came from the technique. Every single engineer. Rafael, which is the agency that developed not only the Iron Dome, but everything else, 75% of their 10,000 engineers are products of this university, the Technion. It's interesting. We have a job fair in the Technion every year. And Rafael bought, to convince students to join them, they bought some kind, they call it a Predator. It's a boat, autonomous boat, that uh, circles around the oil rings in order to protect them. And somebody touched my, my shoulder and he said, President, can I tell you something? I said, sure. He said, you see on this pole, the box? This was my master program. He said, can you tell me what it is? He said, I'm sorry. This is top secret. I cannot tell you. <laughs> Again, necessity is the mother of invention. This changed the game. This was a game changer. Once you are able to intercept a missile coming at you in five seconds, it's a game changer. And we have no choice. We had to do it. Human resources. I was uh, a guest of the Canadian government in Ottawa. And they asked me to give a talk to the general directors of the government uh, offices. And I spoke about the Technion, etc., etc. At the end of my talk, they reached a conclusion unanimously. We should introduce in Canada an army service. Because serving in the army is one of the key elements 
to the maturity of our students, to the ability to take risk, the ability to function independently. And I can tell you, when you have a student who come to the Technion at the age of 24, 25, after spending as a regular soldier for three years and then as an officer for a couple of more years, it's a different student, completely different student. Then a student who started at 18, who is not just sure what he would like to study, etc., etc. So serving in the army is a factor. And then immigration. I don't know if you are aware that Israel absorbed in a period of less than five years, three years, one million people from the former Soviet Union. One million people in Brazil is nothing. But if you calculate the ratio, it's like Brazil would absorb 30 million people in less than three years. This immigration is one of the modern miracles that happened to Israel. They came highly educated, highly motivated. The Technion number of students jumped by 25% within a span of two years to accommodate this immigration. Interestingly enough, some of the students of the time now are faculty members. So immigration played a major role. And then government support. The government support R&D, and uh, you can see the data here. This is the national expenditure on R&D as a percentage of the GDP. Israel is here. By the way, only Korea is following the path of Israel, and they say they learn it from Israel. Look at uh, OECD here, it's 2.1%. In Israel, it's four, between four and four and a half. And if you get support from the government and you fail, you don't have to get, give back the money. If you succeed, you repay the government for the subsidy. So the government trusts that when, when you offer a job, when you offer a project, which is a startup project, you will invest every offer, every effort in its success. And if you fail, it's okay. It's part of the learning experience. But the government play a role. By the way, when you look at the conditions, the target is to promote R&D by lowering the company's risk. The incentive, subsidizing up to 50% of the project cost. You submit it to the government, 50% you are getting, now it's the innovation, the authorities for innovation. Qualifications, there is a committee of experts who evaluate your project and make sure that you are eligible to get this support. And again, the, if the company commercializes the technology or product and generates profit, then you repay. If not, that's okay. So sometimes governments are doing the right thing. And now let me turn to the technical factor. As I said, all these elements wouldn't come to fruition without the technical factor. In my philosophy, in order to change the ecosystem of a country, universities need three elements. A mission, and I think you mentioned the word mission, research, and education. And the mission is important. The Technion was established to provide a mission. Around the turn of the century in Europe, Jewish people couldn't study engineering. Univer universities employed numerous clauses. And the question is how you provide education to Jewish people who would like to study engineering. So in 1909, there was a decision to establish a Jewish university. Cornerstone was laid in 1912. First class started in 1924. The decision was to do it in Ottoman Palestine. At that time, in Ottoman Palestine, there were 50, 60,000 Jews. That's it. That's it. But the decision was to do it in Ottoman Palestine because of the vision that one day there's going to be a Jewish state. By the way, the money came from Moscow. The Vysotsky family, the tea merchant, gave the first gift, and then from New York. Jacob Schiff, a Jewish banker from New York, gave the rest of it. This is the old building that is now a museum. And until 1954, this was the Technion. First class, 1924, 16 men, one woman, studying building engineering, 
and architecture. We had a very important guest in 1923, uh, Albert Einstein. He became the president of the first support group of the Technion outside Palestine, in Berlin and then in Princeton. What Schaul is doing now, Einstein did in 1924. It's uh, But David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, the legendary prime minister of Israel, he was the one who turned the Technion from a pure engineering school to a research university. David Ben-Gurion believed that the Technion is crucial to the survival of the state of Israel. He picked this site on the Carmel Mountain, which was a bare mountain. This is 1952. And uh, he decided that on this site, the first faculty that would open is a faculty of aeronautical engineering. Why aeronautical engineering? Because if Israel to survive, they must have an air force. And to have an air force, you need aeronautical engineers. And they brought a dean from the University of Manchester, Professor Sidney Goldstein, one of the renowned applied mathematicians of the time. And they started on the new campus, aeronautical engineering. And this was the beginning of the Technion. This is the present campus as a research university. But the Technion served the country. I spoke about 54, aeronautical engineering, the 60s, the Microelectronic Institute. The outcome was a modern high-tech industry. In 1969, the Senate of the Technion decided that this engineering school should have a faculty of medicine. Why? Because in the future, technology and medicine should have, go hand in hand. Israel now is an empire of medical devices because of that decision. In the late 80s, early 90s, absorption, the Russian immigration, and now in the 21st century, we address the issues of minorities in a way that no other university is doing it. 12 years ago, 5% of our students were Arabs, Arab Israelis, who are, have Israeli citizenship of ethnic origin Arab. I don't know how many of you know uh, Benny Landa, the name Benny Landa. He's uh, the one behind digital printing, Indigo, an Israeli entrepreneur. He came to us and he said, look, I challenge you to double the rate of Arab students in the Technion, and I give you money for 10 years to do it. Fast forward 12 years, 20% of our students are Arab, the same rate as Arab citizens in Israel, more women than men studying science and engineering. I have no any other university like the Technion with this reverse ratio, gender ratio. How we did it? We do not believe in affirmative action. You cannot be accepted to the Technion based on ethnic origin or religion or color of your skin or any other uh, 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 criteria but excellence. We brought Arab kids to the Technion for eight months of enhanced education, pre-academic training, math, physics, English. Once they completed this program, they competed like anybody else on acceptance. Once they were accepted, and since the first year in the Technion is the most difficult year, we appointed to each one of them big brother or big sister that helped them to overcome the first year. Then we did also empowerment group. Why? Because Arabs don't serve in the army in Israel and they're much younger than the Jewish students. So we form empowerment group to increase their self-confidence, etc. 20% of our students are now Arabs. Again, we believe that this was the, f the uh, mission of the university. The government didn't ask us to do it. We believe that this is social mission of the university. Research. In 1924, when the first class of 17 students started, the keynote speaker was a mining engineer by the name of Menachem Osishkin. And he started his speech in the following words. Practical research and basic research are the two sides of the same coin. And this has become part of the DNA of the techno. Again, an anecdote. 2011, I gave a talk like I gave in Ottawa to the 
uh, Swedish government, I gave it to the, uh, to the Canadian government, I gave it in Stockholm uh, to the Swedish government. And I spoke about, I gave similar talk in uh, Sweden, this was on the occasion of the Nobel Prize ceremony of Danny Schechtman, so all the uh, general directors of the government came to listen to me. At the end of my talk, one of them came to me and said, you know, the Minister of Education of Sweden is going to Israel in a couple of months. Is it possible to visit the Technion? I said, sure, why not? Why? He said, because in Sweden, if you do practical research, you are considered to be second-rate researcher. Universities are ivory tower, isolated from society. They should see what you are doing. Believe it or not, the minister came. And he spent half a day with us. We had a round table. He went back to Sweden and he tried to change it. I don't know if he succeeded, but he tried to change it. We had the same story this year with the Danish Minister of Science. The Danish ambassador came to prepare the visit. She heard about the story of the Swedish and she said, Is he, can he come to the Technion? And we had the same story. In the Scandinavia, practical research is second-rate research. Universities do not have any obligation to society. So, this cannot be taken for granted. Luckily, we have excellent fundamental research, basic research. We have three and a half Nobel laureates. 2004, Aaron Schkanover and Avram Hershko. 2011, uh, Danny Schertman. And 2013, Ari Varshal. Why I say three and a half? Because the first three are faculty members in the Technion. The fourth is only a graduate of the Technion and is a faculty member of the University of Southern California. So I consider him 50%. Many universities would consider him full uh, 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 Nobel laureate, uh, at least the Hebrew University. Uh, um, Aaron Chikanover and Avram Hershko studied in the Hebrew University of Medicine and you find them as their members of uh, 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 group of Nobel laureates. So we have excellent fundamental research. In recent years, we moved to the interdisciplinary phase. We realized that you need to combine expertise from different fields in order to make breakthroughs in science. So we established the Space Research Institute, the Water Research Institute, the nanotechnology, the life science and engineering, the energy program, autonomous system, computer engineering, integrative cancer center, and quantum science and engineering, which is the last one. And you can see there is a name attached to each one of them. Asher, Grand, Russell Berry, Lokey, Grand. These are donors. The Israeli government give a zilch for development. Nothing. We go to the Jewish communities around the world. We support the Technion since 1941. 1941. This year we had a record fundraising of $108 million, which allow us to open the dealer quantum science and engineering center. Without fundraising, we can close the Technion. So the government is very proud of the Technion, but the budget of the entire academic system in Israel is 11 million shekel divided by, it's like 11 million reals. This is, by the way, the budget of University of Missouri in the United States. So we have two types of research in the Technion. We have basic and applied research and proof of concept that is supported by philanthropic and public funding, mostly competitive. And then we have the commercialization with different elements that allow us to commercialize technologies, patents, etc. And we built a mechanism that facilitates commercialization. We have an accelerator on campus. We have an incubator on campus. We have a Technion fund to sponsor our faculty members. As uh, Ari said, I'm, my story is embedded in the Technion. I founded five companies during my lifetime in the Technion. One is a public company, one went under, one is a private, and two are service. Right now, there is a Chinese wall between me and my companies because I'm the chairperson of all the Technion companies. There is an umbrella organization of all the Technion companies, 93 companies. So there is a Chinese wall to avoid conflict of interest. The deal is very simple, 50-50. I have a patent, I commercialize it, the Technion took upon itself all the expenses, company make profit, 
we recover the expenses. The rest is 50-50 between the researcher and the technion. Now we have what we call the purple path for IT. IT is much faster commercialization process. So computer scientists come to me and he said, look, I have something that is ready for the market. I have the investor, I have the CEO. He said, go ahead, do it. When you meet money, either exit or royalties, etc., 20% goes to the technion. And we already signed four deals in the last couple of weeks after we established the purple path. Now, this is our profits from our commercialization. Um, this is 2016. This year we'll have $45 million. This allow me to build two buildings and to invest in animal facility, which is a very tough fundraising target. Education. How you educate your students to become entrepreneurs and to become innovative. And this is a question. We have now in the Technion uh, 4,500 students. Electrical engineering, computer science together are 4,000. This is the largest faculties in the Technion. 69% undergraduate and 31% uh, graduate students. We wanted to change it. We wanted to increase graduate students on the account of undergraduate students. The problem is industry. Say, no, 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 don't do it. We need your engineers. They are waiting for these undergraduate students. A starting salary of a computer scientist, the day he, le he leaves the Technion, is twice the salary of the Technion president. Yeah, amazing. I told my two daughters, I don't understand why you became physicians. Go and study computer science. They want to treat people. Now, universities can try to educate students to become entrepreneurs. It's not easy because there are many, many stages be, 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 between entering the university and uh, taking an action to open a startup. It's not simple. And universities should provide skills to the students that are not technical skills. Innovative skills, financial skills, organizational skills, strategic skills, relational skills. And usually universities fail badly in providing these skills to the students. They don't have it as part of the curriculum. Why? Because we teach in a technical way. Entrepreneurship is an art. You need personal experience, hand-on experience in order to do it. Moreover, innovative skills, we think about Archimedes sitting in his bathtub and shouting, Eureka! This is no longer uh, the way to do innovative breakthroughs. Innovation is a social process. You need meetings of minds in order to reach innovative breakthroughs. And the meeting of minds involves students and faculty members and industry and culture. And how you do it within the university uh, uh, boundaries. So you can do it in certain ways. We moved in the Technion to the flipped class model of teaching recently in several faculties. Traditionally, there is a lecture and there is a homework. Here, the lecture is done at home by a massive online open course prepared for this particular course. The students prepare themselves for the class, come back to the class to discuss in groups with the lecturer. We tested it in several faculties and it's working beautifully. There is only one caveat. You need a lot of instructors to monitor the groups. And this is the different, of course, the issue of budget. This is a course in a sparse and redundant presentation given by uh, Mickey Elad. Mickey Elad is one of our high sci uh, scientists. Home, massive online open course, class discussion with Professor Elad, and again at home, final projects in groups. Working beautifully, the students are happy, very satisfied. Course cultural meeting of minds. We have one course that is a joint course between Greece, Germany, USA, and Mexico. It's principles and practices of global innovation done through the internet. You discuss ideas with students from different cultures, meeting of minds. 
With industry, this is course that is given together with Microsoft, Internet of Things, and these are the projects that the students did together with the industrialists, the, the people of Microsoft. Then there is the formal education. We offer a minor in entrepreneurship, which is an optional to engineering students. We have formal courses in technological, medical, and biotech entrepreneurship. We have one full year of startup MBA program, summer courses, and we have MOOCs open to everybody to get credits. And one of the most successful one is cracking the creativity code given by Professor Meital, Shlomo Meital. We also have inform informal activities. BizTech is a national competition open to students from all universities who compete on building a business plan. We have a uh, thousand students who start. We pick the best 100. We give each one, each group of four students a mentor, seed money, and then we pick the winners and give them money to have their startup. Became very, very uh, uh, um, a successful program. Meeting of minds, we have once a year putting together medical students and engineering students. The medical students bring problems from the hospital that need solution and let them uh, find solutions. These are two examples. One is a smart pillow for patients with chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The other one is using blinking for ALS students. Again, meeting of minds of people coming from different fields. Meeting of minds, aerospace engineering students and electrical engineering students building drones. The prize, by the way, for these kids is sending them to international competitions. So once they build a drone, we finance their trip for international competitions of students like them. This is the BizTech last year, 115 teams of four students each, 30 were picked, 12 left for the final round, and each one of the three winners got money to allow them to start their company. Mentors, meeting of minds. I'm sure that uh, you, if you don't know this man, you know what he produced. Uh, Pendrive, Dov Moran. Dov Moran is the man behind Pendrive. He meets every group of students. And he tells them about his failures and about his success. And they look at him uh, with admiration. This is the man who changed the world. So we have several of our graduates, like Dov Moran. And the fruits, in the last uh, 15 years or so, our graduates, after leaving the Technion, started 1,602 companies by 1,319 graduates. 811 are alive today, creating 100,000 jobs with uh, revenues of close to $30 billion. 56, interestingly, 56% of these graduates came from two faculties, E and CS, computer science and electrical engineering. They raised an uh, investment of $6.4 billion. Interestingly enough, many of them are serial entrepreneurs. This guy, who is a graduate of aerospace engineering, started 29 companies. All of them are alive. All of them are in medical devices. All of the medical devices. This one, 12. Two of them nine, two of them eight, etc., etc. So they don't do it for the money, because once you sell your company for three hundred million dollars, you can buy a house in Monaco and retire. They do it for the interest. It's quite amazing. Israel is number second after China on the Nasdaq stock exchange. Two thirds of these companies were founded by Technion graduates. Two third of these companies. So, again, what I say is our graduates took Jaffa oranges, turned them into semiconductor. This is the line that was given to me by Mayor Bloomberg when I asked him, why did you pick the Technion to have this new university in New York? You took Jaffa oranges, you turned them into semiconductors. I'd like you to do the same for New York. MIT did a survey of uh, which universities would you identify as having created, supported the world's most successful technology innovation ecosystem? They did it in anticipation of a university they opened in Moscow, Skoltech. So they employ close to 100 experts worldwide and they interviewed them. So the Technion here came number six. 
MIT, of course they pay for the study, Stanford, Cambridge, Imperial College, Oxford, and Technion. Then came ETA Zurich, National University of Singapore, TU Munich, Berkeley, uh, and uh, Stockholm. But then they change the question. They say, which universities would you identify as having created, supported the world's most successful technology innovation ecosystem despite a challenging environment? Technion, number one. So I gave this talk in Zurich about a couple of years ago, and somebody raised his hand and said, what is a challenging environment? I said, I'll give you an example. What is a challenging environment? I was on a vacation in Iceland, and I was on a, on a mountain, and the telephone was ringing. And this was the dean of students in the Technion, promising me that every foreign student in the Technion have a gas mask. This was the time that everybody was afraid that Assad is going to attack Israel with chemical warfare. This is a challenging environment. I said, I don't believe any Swiss president of university in his worst nightmares would think about gas mask for his students. This was my concern. So this is a challenging environment. By the way, the second one was uh, anti-polis uh, university in France. And when I ask what is the challenge there, they say, there you have to make a decision. Either you are on the beach or in the university. So this is a challenging university. Let me finish by a couple of uh, words about how we share this experience. We share this experience in two places. First, in New York. Uh, in 2010, the city of New York announced a competition to open a university in New York to help the economy of New York. City six partner to open Graduate School of Engineering. This is from the New York Times. We proposed to New York and they approached the Technion to participate in the competition. We proposed to New York three hubs of research that were tailor-made to the industries of New York, connective media, health tech, and built environment. To, get, to, to make a long story short, we teamed up with Cornell University and we won the competition. This is announced on January 8, 2012. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg, David Scott, and the president of Cornell is next to me. This is... Uh, the headquarters of Google that I mentioned before. We spent there four years, started to teach, and uh, this was uh, a two-year master program and a PhD program with a dual degree. Every student gets a degree from the Technion and a degree from Cornell. By the way, we are the first university in the history of the United States that granted permission to give its own degree on American soil. September 2017, we moved to this campus on Roosevelt Island. It's uh, Beautiful. This building is called the bridge. Why bridge? Because on one side there is industry, on the other side academia. Every student has two mentors. One comes from the academia, one comes from industry. It's a new way of teaching. The studies are done in studio format. Very, very successful. By the way, the city gave the project 100 million of their own and free land. The land will be owned by Cornell because they put the money for the campus. Bloomberg, after he completed his term as a mayor of New York, gave from his own pocket additional $100 million for this campus. Cornell so far invested in this campus $780 million. $780 million. So this is New York. This is the inauguration of the campus. And uh, it's beautiful. This is the first phase of the campus. The second phase will be built in uh, the next five years. Now, uh, my only problem is, this is the classroom, and the teacher is here, and the students are sitting here, and this is the view that they see behind the teacher. How can you focus on the teacher when you see Manhattan in the background? I remember when Tom Mayers, the architect, came to show me in Haifa the design, I told him, whoa, you're crazy. Who put Manhattan, you know, to the students? I mean, who could uh, concentrate on studies? So uh, this is where Lina, my wife, and me standing on the roof of this classroom. By the way, one of the programs that we have here is, uh, we we'll call it runway postdoc pro uh, program. We are looking for postdocs who would like to start their own companies, and we give them money, we give them mentor and space for eight months. If in eight months they are ready for the first round of uh, uh, money, they are out. 
success story. I encourage you to Google Nanit. This is a company started by Asaf Glazer, one of our computer scientists in sleep, in sleep. He is now in the second round of financing, valuation of $65 million after three years. Quite amazing. And again, what we provided him is a mentor. I was one of his mentors because of my expertise and uh, seed money. That's it. He got a salary of $64,000. He will repay the campus once he's profitable, and hopefully at the end, he'll give a mega gift to the school. So this is New York, picked in February 2019, is uh, the world's premier tech city, precisely what Michael Bloomberg wanted. Now, this is another story. This man, his name is Li Ka-Shing. Li Ka-Shing, a Chinese billionaire living in Hong Kong. This is his hometown, Shantao. This is Guangzhou. This is Hong Kong. And he convinced the Technion to open a branch in China in collaboration between the Li Ka-Shing Foundation. His foundation is the second largest in the world after Bill Gates and the Guangdong province. Uh, this is the cornerstone laying ceremony. Shimon Peres was the guest of honor, minister of science, and uh, this is Mr. Li. And uh, the leader that I appointed was Aaron Chikanover, our Nobel laureate. And uh, this is the campus. It's ready. 500 students studying and getting a Technion degree in China. Part of the campus, technological park to bring companies and to commercialize technologies. This is the campus built in two years and two days. Two years and two days. Only the Chinese can do it. So, this is the story of the Technion. And as I started my presentation, I do not believe there is a single country with one university that had such an impact. It's quite amazing. Thank you very, very much for listening. Uh, thank you, Professor Lavi, for giving uh, uh, a passionate uh, testimony of uh, this history. You are part of this history. Uh, I would like, before opening uh, two questions and answer, just to uh, make uh, one comment that uh, several of uh, the types of experience that you mentioned we also have in Brazil with maybe a different scale. And I would like particularly to uh, mention the experience that uh, uh, students are the leaders. And I would like to point out two young people. One is Artur, uh, now a doctoral student, but who began some years ago a, a, a kind of a club, Nucleo de Emprendedorismo da USP, where the students, undergraduate students, help other students to uh, get into this mood and do this track that you presented. And the other is Guilherme, who is there, who is, with his colleagues who are sitting, opened uh, an organization called Emerge, which is trying to help to bring hard science to uh, fruition in this sense. So thank you very much. And I also would like to thank Marina Caldera, who is the head of innovation in the School of Medicine for organizing that and also for trying to help make the bridge between medicine and engineering that was highlighted. Uh, Questions and answers, whoever is uh, 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 seeing us uh, from far away can send an email to IEA Respondi, IEA Respondi, arroba, in Hebrew, strudel, uh, uspi.br. In the meantime, the first, could you just please uh, tell your name for the purpose of uh, Okay. okay, okay. My name is Edson Polischuk, and uh, my question is about uh, the notion of risk and Russians. Uh, I was I was working in Russia during two years in a company in a joint venture company between a Belgian group and a Russian group. It's uh, from Solvay at that time. Uh, in, the, in the domain of PVC compounds. So, and uh, it was in 2004 to 2006, and all of my mates were from the Soviet 
era. And so, uh, uh, for me, it was very appealing the fact that for them, the notion of risk was inexistent. Uh, it means that the study for them, it, it was, uh, it was possible for me, for me to understand that the study for them is very hard. They study a lot. It's a mass study. It's not like, a, uh, more or less, because they didn't follow university in Russia. I was educated here in Brazil, in the region here. So, uh, but for them, the notion of risk was inexistent. And my question is that one million Russians coming from Russia, how was this uh, for them the, the, to, 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 to change I, it? I understand your question. I cannot talk much about the risk the, the attitude to our risk of the Russian immigrants. What I can say is that uh, the impression that I got, at that time I was the dean of medicine during the uh, absorption of uh, the Russian immigration. And I'll give you one example. One day I got a telephone call from one of the Russian immigrants. By the way, the Israeli government opened many incubators for these Russian immigrants who wanted to develop technologies, etc. And one of them called me and he wanted to see me. He knew that I'm an expert on sleep and he wanted to show me the greatest invention for the sleep field. And uh, he came, he was from the Golan Heights and he came holding behind his, uh, you know, under his arm, a mattress that uh, was developed, by the way, about 20 years before in the West, in Denmark, by the way. And he thought that this is new, a sensitive mattress when you sleep, on this mattress, you can follow respiration and, and pulse rates, etc. He didn't know anything. And this was very typical of the Russian immigration, the engineers. They were very narrow in their knowledge, experts on very narrow field, unaware of what was done in any other country. So the challenge was to re-educate them, the challenge. It was the physicians. We had courses for them specific courses in order to expand their knowledge, etc. But I cannot say much about the attitude to our risk because they came from a, a, you know, a society in which there were different way to uh, uh, deal with freedom. So this was probably also influential about the ability to take risk. Thank you. Questions? Uh, my name is Guilherme. Thanks, Professor Ali, for the quick introduction. And thanks, Professor Levy, for your inspiring talk. You said at the beginning of your talk that um, because of your short history, past is not a constraint, right? So I assume if people think they must change, then they change it. What has changed from the DNA of your generation to the DNA of the youth generation in Israel now? Thanks. It's a good question. I think uh, the time is, is not enough in order to really see major changes. But um, I look at my children and uh, I look at my grandchildren. Uh, my concern is that uh, we become uh, addicted to these devices. Um, I don't go any place without ways. I used to have photographic memory, not anymore. So the challenges that we face, not only in Israel, I think every university face, is what are the skills that are necessary for the fourth industrial revolution? What is the profile of the engineer of 2050? We are certain that certain professions are going to disappear. Repetitive physical work will be replaced by robots. Already it is done in, in Ford and, and Mitsubishi, etc. But who can now predict which are the new professions that are going to uh, appear? And I look at my children and they, they don't have, like we have from a very young age, a goal and we knew we are going to be researchers, physicians, etc. Now they take their time and they sample. Um, my son started and he's uh, studying psychology. He's now in high tech. Um, my daughter, two daughters are uh, physicians and uh, they decide to take it easy. So I think that uh, the options now 
um, enormously different than the options that I had when I was uh, at their age. And I don't believe that we know now to direct them. You should do this, you should do that. And uh, this is, I think, the major difference between us and the previous generation, and the new generation. Paolo? First of all, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I was thinking about the ingredients that made possible techno. First is the necessity driving, so technology is necessary to, to the country, but also I think the most, uh, the, it's a short history of the state. So we are, you are not trapped by tradition. Sometimes in science you have to, one generation has to die. So a new idea to take to the place. The problem that physicians made people to, to live longer and things are changing more rapidly than in the past. So it, it creates a tension. And uh, as I mentioned, I am a pathologist. And the question for a university like ours uh, is how to get rid of the bureaucracy, how to give oxygen to the new ideas. Uh, and here at the institute, we we decided to to do to put the the university in face of the mirror, but not the much, so it's a very objective mirror. And uh, if you don't create space for not our students to, to circulate through the different areas, so to have space for, for develop it using tutors or mentors, uh, I would sign the death certificate uh, of the university as it is. How the question so is objective. Technium is new, is young, but not as young. How you manage to get read? Paolo, last night I had wine, so I spoke about my failures as well. You know, in the Technion, there is a search committee that picked the president, one, and he has to convince his uh, professors, all the professors of the Technion, 220, to elect him as a president. So I had to give a speech to the, what we call assembly. And I uh, charted my strategic goal. Number one goal was changing the structure of the Technion. 18 faculties. Do you know what is to deal with 18 deans? Nightmare. It's a, it's a <laughs> nightmares of the worst kind. Everyone knock on your door, ask for budget, argue with you. So I said, let's have a school of engineering, a school of exact sciences, a school of life sciences. It took me four months to realize it will be easier, much easier, to make peace with the Palestinians than change the structure of the technique. <laughs> Why? If ego has a mass, there was a hole at the center of the technion all the way to Australia from the weight. But you have to be clever rather than just. What we did, we bypass the structure by building interdisciplinary centers. The nanotechnology and nanoscience center of the technion comprise of 113 faculty members from eight faculties who collaborate regardless of the silos between the faculties. Life science and engineering. Engineering are sitting in the same building with uh, biologists. We provided the infrastructure. In one case, we provided two buildings, but the rest was done by the faculties. More than that, I did something that was really revolutionary. I didn't know how it would work, but in the Technion, faculty members are recruited by the faculty. The president, I only sign that I approve the recruitment, but I cannot interfere with the process. 
in order to encourage interdisciplinarity, I told the faculties, I'm going to appoint a new committee. These faculty members will be called the president faculty members. It will be on top of what the faculty deserve. So if you have 50 faculty members, I'll give you another one on my account, provided that the committee will search them, will be a special committee. And I appointed a committee of non-tenured faculty members from the young generation, appointed by a man that I trusted. I bought him as a full professor from Harvard, a tenured professor of system biology. And I told them, look, I don't, I'm not going to tell you which to find, a mathematician or a physicist or a physician. The only criterion is pick the men or the women that you would like to see in a laboratory next to yours. This resulted in some fantastic faculty members that they recruited, and I provided the money. So in order to bypass the issues of egos and territorial uh, identity, we created the interdisciplinary wave. Everybody come to study how we did it. By the way, we did it already in New York from the start. So the hubs are interdisciplinary and in China too. So this is the way we did it, and I'm very happy we did it. Okay, uh, in terms of ego, we, are, uh, we have a very important center of technology. Now you are capturing the egoic energy and, and transforming in ego electric. So uh, I think this could be a renewable and unbearable source of uh, energy. Every, every university has it. I can relax. <laughs> Uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, uh, yeah, my name is Elis Menas. I am from uh, FASENS, a uh, engineering faculty, faculty in Sorocaba. Uh, my rector asked you, thank you for, for, for being here. Uh, I would like to know, it's more a curiosity, how you deal uh, in Technion about the security? Not only physical security because of terrorism. Uh, we know that terrorists are very, very much against Israel. And also the cybersecurity. We have a lot of uh, good innovations there that probably it's, it's a target for this the cybersecurity. How do you deal with that? This is a problem, not only for universities, it's a problem for uh, the electrical company, for the bus company, etc. In every faculty, we have a computer engineer, and this is his responsibility. It's not foolproof. I can tell you that uh, sometimes there are penetrations. In areas that are very, very important, we are disconnected from the world. But these are very few. So uh, um, this is the responsibility of the computer engineers in every one of the faculties. We have some central, you know, uh, Israel has checkpoint, and uh, 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 so we employ these uh, 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 firewalls. I do not believe, I do not believe that this is foolproof. The more you defend yourself, etc. So the only way to do it is to cut yourself from the world for this, you know, information or protocols that you don't want by any circumstances to share with the, the Iranians, the Chinese, etc. Uh, I think Ertun Escobar, please. I, uh, Ayrton Escobar, I'm a science journalist here at the university. First of all, I was thinking about what you said about cha a challenging environment. And um, luckily in Brazil, we don't have anything as life-threatening as chemical warfare. We don't need gas masks, but we do have a lot of our own challenges uh, that can be very significant in the, the legal system, the, the bureaucracy, which are enormous challenges to develop research at the universities. and. Um, and on top of that, because of the economic situation, uh, there's a lot of, let's say, ideological challenges and a growing criticism that Brazil has too many universities uh, and that the public universities are too expensive and society doesn't see the benefit, uh, the cost benefit, like we're spending a lot of money in universities and what are we getting from that? So, you know, taking the experience from Technion, how would you help explain to decision makers, the people who hold the money in society itself, the importance of university and academic research. And also, 
mentioning what you said about the, the two sides of the same coin, because there's a lot of pressure that you know, we need more practical research and uh, we need to um, maybe less basic and more applied research, so on. It will be very presumptuous uh, on my account if I come to solve the, problem of, the problems of Brazil. I can tell you from experience, when the politicians wake up, get one Nobel laureate, Wow, they come like they go to Mecca. Everybody would like to take a picture with him. Our prime minister got a personal class in crystallography from Professor Schertmann. We spent two hours with the prime minister after he won the Nobel Prize. Um, I, I believe there, is a, there are ways to uh, um, get the support of uh, the government but you have again to come with a program and to show uh, how you can do it. For instance, dealing with the Arab sector in Israel, now all universities use the Technion as a model. And the government adopted the program and now financed the program in other universities. So you need to publicize what you are doing. You need to go out to the public and show them what is the benefit of having a university? And um, we, uh, I can tell you that uh, my best selling point were the four Nobel laureates. This is attract the attention of the media the way you, it's difficult to imagine. Personally, I believe the Nobel Prize is overrated, but uh, this is my personal observation. <laughs> but uh, this is amazing. So what I suggest is, go out to the public, open the university to the public, and share what you are doing with the public. This is very important. You are, you are right, sometimes the public think about the universities as the ivory tower that is, in Sweden for instance, uh, this was the story. And I don't know if they changed or not. But uh, in Israel universities are open, not only the Technion, universities are open to the public. And uh, uh, they are part of uh, the ecosystem of innovation. We're going to, if there is a last, que last question, because we have to have some lunch and go to FAPESPI after lunch. So, is there any other question? So, may I ask just a question that I heard once an answer, just want to see, to check if the answer that I heard is correct. Is, no, it's the following. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, measures of uh, uh, academic productivity, our papers published, etc., etc. Uh, the fact, and you showed us some examples, that uh, Technion is involved in many, uh, let's say, uh, sensitive subjects, probably uh, also affects the capacity of researchers to publish. Yes. So, first, is it true? And second, how do you deal with that in terms of not hindering the promotion of, uh, of somebody? That's, uh, yes. I, I think I mentioned before that uh, when you have uh, the conflict between to patent or to publish, and the uh, young investigators say, I couldn't care less about patents, I'd like to publish, this is, from my point of view, this is the right decision. And we do not interfere and force him to patent the technology before we publish it. This is his decision. Research that has to do with sensitive uh, national uh, security, the researcher sometimes knows that he cannot publish the results. And uh, we do not encourage young investigators to go along this way. Only mature, uh, seasoned researchers that won't sacrifice their academic promotion. And this is very important. And this is usually the function of the dean to accompany the uh, career of the young scientist in order to direct them. Um, but very small number of research projects in the Technion are not published. Very small number. Uh, almost everything is published. Otherwise, how you go up in the Shanghai ranking? I do not believe in ranking, but this is beside the point. Okay, so uh, again, I would like on behalf of everybody 
to thank very much uh, Professor Perez Lavi for giving this inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, again, we this morning had the opportunity to sign the renewal of the agreement. Professor Laura, on behalf of the International Office, was there. The uh, provost of undergraduate and graduate studies were there. Some areas were discussed. Uh, probably the area of energy was one area that uh, was very highly, uh, let's say, put in, in, in focus. And uh, uh, I also would like to thank Marcus Vinicius for uh, giving him, uh, Professor Lavi, uh, this introduction and uh, to the team of the Institute who always uh, helps. Uh, this uh, will be tape, is taped and will be uh, offered uh, in the Videotheca from uh, the Institute in uh, uh, next week probably. And so uh, please uh, let's give a round of applause to Professor Lavi and thank you again for coming. Thank you.